Michael Oslin is a fellow in contemporary Asia for the Hoover Institution. He's also the author of The End of the Asian Century, War, Stagnation, and the Risks to the World's Most Dynamic Region. He joins us now to discuss. Welcome, Michael. It's so great to have you with us. What are the top priorities for the United States going into this second summit? Well, the stated top priority is to get a process going forward on denuclearization between uh, the United States and North Korea, you know, following on the last summit in Singapore. But I think the real uh, agenda is twofold. Number one, it's to maintain this momentum between the president uh, and Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. And it's also to explore the degree to which the two can essentially come to uh, a meeting of the minds on the future of North Korea's nuclear program, meaning uh, will there be a freeze on future development? Will there be a cap on production of missiles? How will the two go forward if they can't actually nail down what we haven't been able to do for 25 years, which is a realistic path to denuclearization? So what then will North Korea be looking to get out of this discussion this time around? Because presumably each side wants to come away with something concrete after the second summit. Right. Uh, so for the North Koreans, uh, this is a creeping process of normalization. And, and I think the White House has basically accepted that. So for Kim Jong-un, this is uh, part of his continued world tour of being accepted as a, uh, a, a major global leader, a major regional leader. So that that's the first thing, is that he's not uh, isolated and he's not considered irrelevant to uh, what's going on in, in East Asia. Uh, I think the second thing is to get the administration to continue to release pressure on the North Koreans end sanctions or at least uh, at least water down sanctions further which have certainly hurt the North Korean economy and uh, which the White House has not been pursuing as aggressively because it has been more interested in the diplomatic option so I think I think that is uh, that is second and probably third is some type of announcement between uh, the president and Kim Jong-un that, of course, they're going to be going forward with a, an ultimate commitment to denuclearization. But in reality, they're, they're setting the relationship up to be one where North Korea more or less keeps the nuclear arsenal it has, but it doesn't expand it. I think mm. that's what the North Koreans would like to get out of this. And then how could this summit and this creeping normalization of, of relations, as you put it, affect security in the rest rest of the Korean peninsula. Well, that's that's the great question. This is in some ways a revolution in North Korean policy that that President Trump is proposing. Um, he's trying to personalize this relationship with Kim Jong Un and therefore uh, ostensibly reduce the risks of conflict or, or war. Uh, he is, as I as we've been talking about, normalizing North Korea so that it's acceptable now for Kim Jong Un to meet with other world leaders, and he's been doing so with his Japanese and his South Korean and, and Chinese counterparts and uh, and and beyond. So I think the next steps is actually that Kim Jong-un gets farther out into the world. All of that is designed essentially to give North Korea a stake in, in maintaining stable relations and peaceful relations with the countries around it. So this is, this is a different approach. It's not one that we really have a playbook for. And I think both sides will be feeling their way forward as they try to understand whether this is viable or not. And, and Michael, this summit comes as the president seeks a deal to end the trade war with China. How does this fit into Mr. Trump's larger Asia strategy? Is it significant vis-a-vis -vis China? That's a great question. I think it is because for decades, of course, since the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War, it is China that has been North Korea's main ally and, uh, and lifeline economically uh, and politically. Uh, I think Trump is trying to change that equation. Um, uh, it is one reason I think that the Chinese have been so quick uh, to reach out to North Korea and invite uh, Kim Jong Un to come there multiple times already. Uh, they don't want to be cut out by the United States. They don't want to see some sort of agreement between North Korea and the U.S. that reduces their influence on the peninsula. So this is uh, this may not be quite at the level of what uh, President Nixon was doing with uh, the Soviet Union and, and China back in the 1970s. But I think that Trump, uh, at, at least instinctively, I'm not saying it's an articulated approach, but I think at least instinctively, is attempting to create a new dynamic uh, whereby the North Koreans see that they can have some maneuvering space 
between both the U.S. and China. And quite frankly, Kim Jong-un wants that. He wants that maneuvering space. It's good for him. We just have to make sure we don't give him too much of it and that we continue to, to try to pressure this regime at a minimum to freeze and, and cap its nuclear program and better, of course, to try to denuclearize it. A delicate balance, of course. Now, many observers have noted that China is taking an increasingly aggressive stance toward the U.S. Is that something that you have noted as well? And if so, how do you think the president's trade policy is playing into that? Well, clearly the, the trade policy, the tariffs that have been levied, and of course the threat of, of more tariffs even with this extension, uh, for the first time have really uh, rocked the Chinese back on their heels uh, for 40 years. And this year, we shouldn't forget, is the 40th year of normalization between the United States and China, normalized relations. Uh, for the first time in 40 years, the Chinese really feel that there is pressure coming from the United States and not just rhetoric. Uh, now, many critics are worried that the president will rush to some type of face-saving agreement with China so as to, to end the, the problems that American small and medium producers have been experiencing with the tariffs that, in essence, he will cave. But looking at it from Beijing's perspective, this is the first time an American president has really tried to pressure them and has followed through not only on campaign statements, but statements afterwards. So uh, they're trying to figure out how to deal with this president. And if you look at what's happened over the past two years since they began this, this diplomatic uh, dance of, of will we have a, a trade war or not, the Chinese, uh, of course, they bluster and they, they threaten uh, that this will harm the American economy. But at the same time, they continually come back to the table and they dispatch the highest level envoys to the United States to keep the dialogue going. So I think that the, the leverage actually lies with the president. The Chinese economy is undergoing a significant slowdown. It faces many problems that we don't really talk about as much here on a day-to-day -day basis, but which they are very aware of. Uh, and they cannot uh, survive, they cannot weather a trade war as well as the United States can. So if the president holds firm, uh, I think there is a, a great likelihood of a deal. The real problem, of course, is getting China to live up to that deal. Right. And would you agree then that China is turning, uh, is becoming more aggressive towards the U.S.? Well, I think that aggression has been growing. I think you saw it clearly in the last years of the Obama administration with the island building campaign uh, in the South China Sea and the threats to the United States, uh, the fact that President Xi Jinping promised President Obama to his face that China would stop uh, cyber attacks on the U.S. And, and then did nothing about it. So um, I, I think the aggression has been growing. The difference with the Trump administration is that uh, they're the first not to turn the other cheek, and they're the mm -hmm. first not only to acknowledge it, which the Obama people did as well, but to try to do something about it. So you've seen arrests of Chinese intelligence agents. You've seen the sanctioning of Huawei, uh, the telecommunications giant, and, and um, questions about whether Huawei will be able uh, to actually build its 5G networks in the United States. And in the South China Sea, you have seen uh, a, a dramatic increase in freedom of navigation operations on the part of the United States Navy. So uh, this, the, the um, aggression, so to speak, or certainly the assertiveness that China has been showing to the United States has been countered by the Trump administration. The problem is that you're getting into a spiral of, of tit for tat, and, and what needs to happen is that the Chinese will recognize uh, that the U.S. and some of the U.S. partners, including Japan, are not going to back down, not let China unilaterally rewrite the rules for doing business in the region or the security arrangements in the region, and therefore come to an agreement with us. Right. Well, since obviously you study this region so closely, and contemporary Asia is, is a point of, of expertise for you. Do you then think that the hardline stance that the administration is take, taking is effective for a country like China? Uh, the jury's still out. Uh, I, I think overall it is. I think authoritarian nations um, respond to uh, uh, essentially to to firm backbones, to shows of strength. I think you saw it in the Cold War. Uh, I think you, you've seen it at other points in time. Um, but China is China is extremely strong, obviously, and it has a uh, it has a global economic footprint that the Soviet Union didn't have. So it's trying to build uh, the One Belt One Road project as a way to uh, link Eurasia with it and not the United States. This is the beginning, I think, of a much longer struggle between the two. The jury's out whether uh, it will be effective with China. But what you can say so far is that the Chinese have not walked away from the table. Uh, they have continually come back to discuss with. 
with the United States. Uh, and uh, we, we see the beginnings, I would say, of some type of cooperation between the United States uh, and, and its allies in, in essence, um, uh, opposing China in areas like the South China Sea. And the Chinese are worried about that as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Michael Oslin, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. My pleasure. Thank you.